Hello! Let's talk today about The Theory of Bastards by Audrey Shulman. All right, I'm having myself another little sit down today. Got a fireside chat coming at you because this book, The Theory of Bastards by Audrey Shulman, there's a lot to talk about. There's a lot to talk about in this book. A um, lot of stuff to unpack. The bastards, they're so complicated. So let's get right to it. It follows a scientist named Frankie. She has stage four endometriosis that she is recovering from. She's had a big major surgery. Meanwhile, she is a brilliant, brilliant scientist who has done several different research um, things is that the scientific term for it? Research things? <laughs> Studies on mating habits of both humans and animals. Of course, it's a very sexy subject, so it has caught the attention of the media, and she has made a lot of money and a lot of notoriety for herself. Helped definitely by the fact that because of her endometriosis, she is very cranky. <laughs> She's lived her entire life in pain and she gets right to the point. She has no time to mince words. She does not suffer fools. She just gets right to it and will tell it like it is, which makes her really great for sound bites. So she goes to this um, primate house, this primate research facility in which they research different types of animals, bonobos, chimps, gorillas, what have you and all these brilliant scientists all these brilliant um tools that they have at their disposal they want frankie there because of her notoriety and her fame she would bring along with her the chance for a lot more grants and it would help with the survival of the facility also with all those funds and brilliant minds and attention coming in meanwhile they are living in the future not the far off future, not the inconceivable future, nothing that you would not be able to fathom. I would say maybe it's more like 10 to 20 years in the future. At this point in the future, wearable tech is kind of on the way out. Instead, it's all about implantable technology. She talks about how most people have a bindi and they walk around interacting with the projection that the bindi is giving onto their contact lenses that only they can see and scanning through different things. So it's kind of like you think about people nowadays are always going to use my visual aid here, always staring at their devices, walking around, staring at their phones and what a blight upon society that seems like. Imagine instead that all that technology is implanted into the person and they're walking around just kind of blindly staring at their tech, not even seeing the world that's literally right around them. Even though this convenience is supposed to make the two worlds, the virtual world and the real world, enmesh and interact better, it just makes the real world dissolve that much more because they're that much more immersed into the virtual world. Going on a long-winded explanation of that, basically it's the future. Everything, everything, everything runs through technology. So when you think about nowadays, if like your electricity goes out, it's practically like living on little house on the freaking prairie. So when you think about in this technology centric world, if all the tech were to go down, holy crap. I mean, the world would stop existing basically. It would be like um, that movie Wally, -E where they had to land the plane and get back to basics and pretty much start the world over again. So did my explanation really tell you what this book is about? No, no, it did not. Because here's what I can't really tell you is what this book is about. <laughs> I don't know. It covers so many different things and as soon as I thought I had it nailed, as soon as I thought I knew exactly what the author was getting at, like, oh, well this is obviously a parable about our dependence on technology and getting back to basics, or oh, this is a character study of a woman who is in deep pain, who is coming of age finally now that she's able to live a life 
that um, involves her human self as opposed to just her pain-centric self. Or, oh, this is a story about scientific research and the morality of housing the apes and what that means about us and how close they are between um, us evolution-wise. <sighs> you know, I thought all of these things at the same time. I don't know exactly if it's purely about any of those things. Um, it's more like I can tell you what it's not about. <laughs> it's not about one one specific thing. I'm rambling, aren't I? I'm rambling because my mind is still kind of working this out as I talk through it. It's about all of these things. All of these things are enmeshed. The primates are enmeshed with this world that's based on technology, which is enmeshed with this scientist who is trying to figure out the base human needs while relying so heavily on this technology. It is not lost on me that we um, focus on primates so much in this story and in the meantime we focus so much on this technological age that they live in. So it's a really good juxtaposition there that we're looking at between um, a step backwards evolution-wise and a step forward evolution-wise. Now which being is on which side of that? I will let you decide because you could say that the primates are actually more advanced because they seem to be more in touch with all of their needs, their sexual needs, their mating needs, their parenting needs. Um, they're a lot more in touch with that. The technology side keeps glitching. It keeps glitching all the time and she has to keep rebooting her self. <laughs> She has to reboot this technology that lives inside of her body, and so which is more advanced? It's for us to ponder. Very interesting, very interesting, and it's nice to see how the two play against one another. In the middle of it is humans. What exactly has our step up in the evolutionary chain, what exactly has that gotten us? You really see the world kind of laid to ruin by all of these excesses and um, reliance on things that aren't necessarily sustainable. Now I thought at first that the author was really trying to go for some shock value because <laughs> she looks at the bonobos and their habits, um, their sexual habits, and those things get it on like, well, like bonobos. <laughs> it's crazy! And I did not realize that, so I watched a couple of documentaries about it on the YouTubes to see if the author was just going for shock value or if that is a true fact. And it's true. Bonobos really go for it. They, they're called the hippies of the jungle because instead of making war, they just make love all the time with everyone in every conceivable combination and position possible they like to do it a lot. I think it goes back to those base urges that the bonobos are so in touch with that they want to do it, they do it. They want to eat, they eat. They're in touch with their base needs and urges and they are in touch with their biological selves. Whereas humans, who are supposedly a step up on the evolutionary chain, we have wrought so much destruction with all of our reliance on technology to the point that we don't know how to be in touch with our biological selves anymore. Like the thought for me of even just um, anything, anything like my cell phone going down is just like oh, horrible, horrible. So it makes me think of one of my very favorite short stories by Ray Bradbury called There Will Come Soft Rains. It shows a snapshot of a house that is slowly being reclaimed by nature post-apocalypse. It, it runs on all sorts of wonderful technology like robots that serve the lunch and the dinner and clean it up and read a poem to the family at nighttime and the lights that are automated and all these wonderful things that I want to build within my own home. <laughs> and um, after the apocalypse, nature starts to reclaim it. A tree crashes into the house, a dog walks in and dies, and 
people had their chance and laid it all to waste. Going on a bit of a tangent, aren't I? <laughs> you know, I'm saying all these things and sounding like one of those crazed people on a hilltop trying to proselytize to everyone that walks by any sort of random things that come into my head, but I believe in technology. I love it. I want the house from there will come soft rains in which robots come and do all my bidding for me and I pretty much don't have to human because the robots will do that. <laughs> but it is interesting to think about um, what happens when all this technology crashes. What's going to happen to us? Um, what's going to happen to us evolution wise? It's very, very interesting. Or what happens to us when the machines rise up and kill us all? Okay, so I feel like this discussion very much mirrors the book in that it's kind of all over the place, hopefully linear-ish, because there was a story to be found in the book. I do feel like it all came together so nicely, and I was engrossed in Frankie's story, and I was engrossed in the bonobos, and what was going to happen to them next. So here's my review. I loved it. <laughs> Excellent book. The Theory of Bastards. Totally weird, which means it's right up my alley. I would love to know what you guys think of it as well. It's kind of interesting to see the different opinions because a lot of them seem to have the same opinion as me, which is WTF did I just read? <laughs> in a good way, in the most wonderful of ways. All right, I will talk to you guys later. Thank you so much for joining as always and see you next week. Bye. So I would be surprised if we're not already experimenting with 3D printed food. It tastes terrible in the book and I would imagine it would taste terrible in real life too.